Hello and welcome to a humble Highland home. Thank you so much for being with me here today. I speak quite often about the power of a resilient community and I like to factor this into my veggie growing planting plan at the beginning of each year as per the principles of permaculture. I like to be able to trade and barter and gift with others. Our apple trees are still quite young and are just getting them self-established. We currently have two planted, which were planted one year apart. So each autumn I'm trying to plant a new fruit tree that will add to our food forest layering system in the garden. I personally prefer to plant trees in autumn rather than springtime. So the root of the tree has got time to settle into its new home and rest over the winter months before the springtime growing season starts and takes some of the energy into producing next year's growth and hopefully some buds, flowers, which eventually form the fruit. We've still got a few eaten apples to be picked from our young trees but my neighbour has kindly offered some apples from their orchard which they have an absolute abundance of so in exchange I offered a bag of fresh garden produce for this generous apple offer. We like to eat as seasonally as we can. So we try to preserve seasonal foods for when things are not so readily available. And at the moment, there are lots of apples on the go. Foods that are in season tend to be a lot more affordable in the shops and at the local farmers markets. So to me, it makes sense to gain these foods when they're at the best and the most cost effective to preserve and store them for the months ahead. And I like the idea of being able to eat tomorrow for yesterday's prices. I had some black eyed Susans and some marigolds that had fallen over in the garden. So they're perfect to use as fresh cut flowers now. And a sure sign of autumn is the days are getting shorter and we're having to put the light on a lot earlier in the day now. I'm sorting the apples into three piles, some for eating fresh, some that have got unblemished skins and ones with damaged skins. I currently have enough eating apples in our fruit bowl so I'm going to wrap these in paper so that I can preserve them for as long as I can but they'll still be good to eat fresh. This paper is being recycled from a delivery that we received so the timing was just perfect so nothing goes to waste. Now that these eating apples have been wrapped separately in paper, they are going to be stored in a cool, dark place and I will check them periodically just to make sure that none of them have spoiled. These apples are earmarked for dehydrating. I'm getting them on the go first as they can take a, quite a long time to dry out depending on how thick they've been cut. I'm making sure that all the skins are getting a really good clean because I intend to save them and use them later on. The apple coring and slicing machine is a great help when it's working properly. I think I might have to ask Adam to have a wee look to see if it can be adjusted any. 
So the skins and the cores go into a separate pot, whilst the rest of the apple gets broken up onto the dehydrating sheets. Once dried, these apples store really well in an airtight container. We've still got some that I dried last year. We use them as snacks and we add them to cereal and sometimes into baking. And as soon as Adam's in from work, he gets roped in to give him a helping hand. With the rest of the apples, I'm going to peel and core them before chopping them up and popping them in a freezer bag to get them ready for the deep freeze. I normally prefer to flash freeze my fruits and vegetables before adding them to the deep freeze. Flash freezing just means putting things on a tray so that they're not touching before freezing them and then adding them to a storage bag once they're frozen. And this way you can just use as much or as little as you want as they won't stick together. But I generally find that apple chunks are quite easy to separate once frozen. So I'm adding them straight to a bag ready to be stored away. I'm trying to work as quickly as I can to avoid the apples browning quite as bad before they get into the freezer. Sometimes I might add a little bit of a lemon juice which can prevent browning but I'm just going for speed this time. It really is a team effort tonight but I think we both will be immensely grateful for this little haul over the coming months and the work and time and effort that we're putting in just now will pay dividends. This is a great example that not all investments need to be financial. I've spoken many times before about how we try to avoid producing waste so with the unblemished apple skins and the cores we've been adding to this big stock pot it's actually an old pressure cooker but i've never used it as a pressure cooker so these peelings and cores are going to be made into a scrap apple jelly i'm not specifically weighing anything but i will leave the basic recipe in the description below I've poured in enough cold water to come up to the level of the apple skins and cores. Then I've allowed it to cook until all the cores and peelings are soft and mushy. Then it's time to strain the juice through a fine weave muslin cloth, just like a cheese cloth, but don't squish it down else the jelly will end up cloudy. I'm going to leave this overnight for it to drain naturally. As I get ready this morning to finish off making the scrap apple jelly, I have put a small white plate in the freezer and I have got some recycled glass jars and the lids sterilised ready for the fresh jelly. I need to measure how much liquid we've been able to gain so I know how much sugar and lemon juice to add. 
So for each measurement of liquid gain, I add half measurement of sugar of my choosing. Then the liquid goes back to the pan and up onto the cooker to be brought back up to heat, up to a rolling boil until it starts to thicken. Remember to keep stirring it, especially as it heats up so that you dissolve all the sugar. I nearly forgot the lemon juice. So in it goes and I will let it continue to boil until we're ready to test its setting point. You can skim off the white foam off the top of the jelly if you prefer. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Keep stirring the jelly though and watch for it rising up the center of the pan as it can quickly boil over and create quite a sticky mess. I've never been caught out completely, but I've had a couple of close calls. So I have my sterilized jars now heating in the oven on a very low setting. And this is the plate that I put in the freezer earlier to test for the setting point of the jelly. The cold plate helps the couple of drops of jelly that I've put on there to cool very quickly. And what I'm looking for is when I draw a line through the jelly, it shouldn't meet in the middle again, which it is on this one. So I need to cook it a little bit longer and test it again. So this time I can see that the line in the middle is staying in place and the jelly is wrinkling slightly. So we're good to go. I've allowed the jelly to cool just slightly so the jars and the jelly should be at approximately the same temperature. I have experienced the occasional jar crack on me and this is why I prefer to use small jars so you don't lose so much if this does happen. Once all the jars are full, give them a wee wipe round the rim and use a knife to allow any bubbles to escape if you need to. Then it's time to screw the lid down tightly and as it cools, it's a beautiful sound as all the lids should compress to form a seal and you should hear the occasional popping sound. I'm going to label and date these before they head off into the pantry. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I hope you've enjoyed today's video and you're all making the most of the onset of autumn. Take care of yourself and others and I'll see you in the next video.